Welcome to episode number 50 of Ask Alika. We're at the big 5-0 and I'm excited today because I have with me Bruno Congawon. Did I get that right, Bruno? Congawon. <laughs> and Bruno is a master headshot photographer based in Perth, Western Australia. After more than a dozen years working in the corporate slash accounting industry, Bruno entered the world of corporate headshot photography. Bruno crafts corporate headshots that exude confidence, approachability, and authenticity. Bruno is one of 70 handpicked associate headshot photographers of the world renowned headshot and portrait photographer Peter Hurley. So, Bruno is a big deal when it comes to corporate headshot photography. Welcome aboard, Bruno. Thank you, Zion. It's great to be on board with you today. Yeah, look, happy to have you here. And I'm even more excited than I was before. I've always been excited about this uh, interview for many reasons. Uh, we've, we've met earlier and mm -hmm. I know about you from Perth. You're actually really well known. Yes. Uh, and I recently found out that you used to play in the NBA <laughs> Basketball Association. So I'm a massive basketball fan. But let, let's start with a big bang. Like, how did, like, when did you play in the NBA and for who? Um... Playing in the NBA is one of those uh, hidden uh, <laughs> parts of my life. And uh, because at the time when I played in uh, 1987-88, we don't have the ascendance of uh, internet and video, YouTube as uh, it is now. So for that reason, you know, people find it a little bit hard. If I say that I was in the NBA, they go look for footage, they cannot find it. And uh, for that reason, they just have to go back, find some old articles on newspapers, you know, to eventually find out, oh yeah, you know, so he was uh, with uh, the Milwaukee Bucks. But it was in 1987, I finished uh, college and I didn't get drafted. And uh, I was fortunate enough that Dell Harris, the head coach at uh, Milwaukee Bucks at the time, he used to be in Houston. He used to be the head coach at Houston. And uh, he watched me play with his, against his son, and uh, he watched me play college basketball locally. And uh, our stadium at my college used to be the designated stadium for Houston Rockets visiting teams to practice. So that means if the Lakers are playing against the Houston Rockets, we may be finishing, uh, you know, practice. Magic Johnson, you know, and the guys, they're walking into the training room at the same time. Or at all the time, they could be sitting there having their ankles taped while we're getting our ankles, you know, wraps, you know, cut off. So we get to mix up with a lot of those guys and they get to know about us as well. When they come in town, they look at the newspaper, hey, man, you threw up 35 last night <laughs> and so on. So we get to, you know, uh, have a little bit of chat with those guys and having those guys come into this training room with us over four years and then eventually get to find yourself uh, somewhere in their vicinity or sharing space with them. It was unreal. But I didn't get drafted, but uh, Coach Dale Harris uh, took the liberty of inviting me to training camp uh, for a free agent. And so on. then I went to training camp. Uh, they had 35 people there vying for two spots. And I was one of the two people that they selected. Wow. And, uh, and they wanted to use me as a project player. So for them, a project player is someone that they want to groom, you know, to be a, a particular type of player. And because of my versatility in college, they wanted to make me a defensive player who is a threat as well in offense. And because I could guard seven foot two, could guard a six foot guy or five foot ten guy as well. And if I was to guard someone my height or size, you know, that would be okay as well. And for that reason, I ended up in Milwaukee and uh, was on the bench for some time. But uh, there were some times that I got to run the court for a couple minutes and stuff. <laughs> and uh, so basically, that's how you wow. know, I ended up in Milwaukee. And it's one of those things that I don't talk about very much. But uh, when the occasion presents itself, I talk Ama about it. Amazing. Yeah. The things you find out about people. So basically, they were, the coaches were trying to um, develop you into a De Dennis Rodman type role. Dennis Rodman type who can run the court, shoot the basketball, and put the ball on the floor if you need it. Okay, amazing. Yeah. So then you had your stint in the NBA after a couple of years. Um, what did you do after that? Did you go into the corporate world straight after that? Or? No, not. Uh, I had an, another chance as well to play abroad. So I went to France because I spent some time in France as a youngster. 
So I went to France, I played you know, four months in France. And uh, while I was in France, I went back to Houston and a team from Australia, the Illawarra Hawks. Yeah. So they were touring the States at the end of the Australian season. So they were looking for players. And, uh, you know, I was m mentioned to them that, hey, if you're looking for, you know, an all-around player, and then, you know, this guy would be, you know, someone to look at. So they invited me to go, you know, on their the le last leg of their tour in the U.S., and uh, we, I played two games with them, and <laughs> things didn't work out because, uh, obviously, after playing in the NBA, you know, you get a uh, few zeros behind the numbers, and uh, coming to Australia, when they're offering you something like fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 for the year, you say, well, what, are you crazy, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so on, so for that reason, I didn't want to, you know, entertain the idea to come to Australia, yeah, yeah. because the pay package was, wasn't there. And uh, they picked up one of my good friends, Patrick Fair, who we played similar top top again, but he was about 6'5". And uh, Patrick came over and did very well. And for some reason, they kind of uh, referred me to a, a Seville, which is a Southeastern Basketball League. Okay. Uh, yep, yep. Yeah. And uh, so they approached me to come, and at that time I was injured in Milwaukee. So my contract was just expired. And uh, the likelihood of me going back was that coach wanted me to go back to Houston, get myself sorted out, mm. you know, lift weights, get bigger, get stronger, whatever, then go back, you know, to training <clears throat> camp the following year. So during that time, they gave me, they released me from my contract that I could actually do anything I want. If I wanted to go back to Europe and play, I could do that or do whatever I needed to do. Because on the contract, even if you're injured, you cannot play with anybody else. Mm. So since they released me, and the team from Tasmania approached me to come and play in this Cebu, and I said, yeah, I think about it. And I said, no, nah, I'd rather come to Australia, but go to Illawarra and see, because I like the guys, so I wanted to play with them. <laughs> anyway, so I came, and things didn't work out, and uh, met a girl from Tassie, and the girl happened to be from Devonport. It's a team that wanted me to come and play with them in the simple as well. I say, wait a minute, let me go visit Chris and see how things go. And I end up in Tasmania and uh, stayed there for 11 years, got married to Chris and uh, didn't play basketball as much, but uh, I was fortunate enough to meet some right people along the way. And they kind of helped me up, uh, set up a business, ah. which I ran with for the 11 years that I was in Tasmania. And uh, while I was doing my own thing, you know, I finished college with the finest degree and uh, I didn't want to pay for accounting fees, you know, too much at the end of the year. So I wanted to do my own accounts and then just give uh, the book work at the end of the year to an accountant to file the tax return for me. And uh, the company was a manufacturing company. I don't know anything about manufacturing. All I knew that I could run a business, that, that was it. So I got the right people to run the business, and I was just there to make sure that everything is okay, bills are, bills are paid, and uh, I had plenty of time in my, on my hand to do what I, whatever I wanted to do, so I decided to go back to uni. So I went back to uni to do commerce. And uh, so once I finished commerce, I uh, went into doing you know, CPA, and uh, that's where the accounting bit kind of fell into it. So I was doing all of those things on my own time. So when I split up with my ex and decided to sell the business and then move on, that's what I started working as an accountant. Wow. And uh, I did want to actually work for anybody. I always wanted to work for myself. And for that reason, I decided to pack my bag, left Melbourne, left Tasmania for Melbourne. Then six years in Melbourne, I decided to come to Perth. And uh, that was 10 years ago when I arrived in Perth and uh, work with the government superannuation board for a little while and uh, work with the pharmaceutical distribution company for a year or so and met my current wife and we decided to move on to do our own thing because our company was sending her to Indonesia. Yeah. And uh, so it's there that things kind of changed for me as well because uh, when I encouraged her to go and I would go with her as an accountant, I could get a job anywhere. And uh, unfortunately, I got a lot of work, but the pay packet wasn't there as well for me because you cannot get up in the morning and then go work for, you know, what you're not worth. Mm. And uh, so for that reason, I took up my photography and that's where the photography came in. Right. So yeah. did you start doing it on the side? Photography was always my passion since high school, mm. you know, besides basketball. 
So if I wasn't playing basketball or if we were on a trip or whatever, I was always with my camera taking photos of passerbys and, you know, beautiful girls. Oh, look at this guy over there and so on. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I had so many CDs of uh, negatives and so on and uh, uh, slides. But uh, it was in uh, Jakarta where, you know, my wife and I were, that's where the photography kind of jumped in. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And then, <clears throat> so now, you know, you're, you're really renowned. Like, have you, what, what makes you different from the others? Because you are well known in the industry. Like, a few yeah. people have already, we, we, we don't, you know, like, we didn't know that each of us knew you, um, but then your name came up. And so you're quite renowned. What makes you different? Uh, the thing about uh, the difference between what I do and uh, most people around as well, you know, do, is that uh, when I wanted to approach a headshot as a full-time endeavor, I actually purposely sought out the best headshot photographer in the world to know how and why he does what he does. And uh, it's simple. You know, I've been fortunate in life that anything that I did, I did it with the best around. You know, whether playing high school, college, had a chance to play in the NBA, had a chance to play in the Olympics, won the African Games. So everything that I've done was, you know, at the highest level. So for that reason, my mindset is always, if I want to do something, I got to go to the person who's done it before me, if I haven't done it yet, and who's the best at it, and see how can they help me get where I need to go. Yeah. So I reached out to Peter Hurley, and uh, he told me that, Bruno, unfortunately, I cannot take you on as a one-to-one. -one. I don't do one-to-one -one session. I got a coaching platform that I would like you to join if you want to learn from me. So I joined that co coaching platform, which is called the Headshot Crew. And it's comprised of uh, over 14,000 photographers from around the world, you know, 140 or 60 countries now. And uh, so I joined that platform and where he coaches us every week. And if you actually picking up some of the stuff that he throwing at us and so forth, and uh, he reviews your gallery and uh, sees that you're worth, you know, becoming one of his associates. So he would make you an associate of his. That means you carry his badge. That means your work is near his, uh, you know, level level and so on and uh, he is confident that if he was to get a job in Australia that he can sh shoot that job and uh, he said hey my associate Bruno can do that job so when people look at my gallery and look at Peter's gallery they can see similarity there almost to the point that uh, our work you cannot discern which one is which if we were to put two photos together wow. yeah and uh, so that's the reason why and because I'm actually mentoring other photographers as well on how to do the headshot and not just here in Perth but around the world and uh, even though our photos might look the same but if you look at my lighting my lighting is per per I mean set up for purpose and uh, each individual that come to my studio if I come to your office here I would photograph you differently than I would be photographing Jason or than I would be photographing the girls there so I don't just put one light where everybody just comes and stands in front of it and you take photos. And uh, another thing about uh, the photography, it's not about photography for us in a headshot crew or for me. If I come to photograph you, it's all about you. My photography only enhances that. And uh, my photography doesn't have to be an issue whatsoever. That means my camera setting, my lighting, all of that, I don't have to mess around with that stuff. That stuff, it's like, my tools, I have it in my bag. I just pull it out and pull it out. And all I have to do is spend the time coaching you to make you feel and look comfortable in front of the camera where I can actually get that winning shot that you actually hired before. And that's the difference between what we do as opposed to having someone with the preset lighting or backdrop and stand over here, yeah. one, two, three, smile, and so on. So we don't do that. And you, you have a way of making feel, people feel comfortable, don't you? Exactly. So let's say right now, if I wanted you to, uh, to do something for me, can you see your face right now? Can I see my face? Yeah. No. No, exactly. So you don't know what your face is doing right now. That means I become your mirror. 
Right. So if I want you to do something for me, I can actually get you to do it. You see, now you're mimicking right now just by doing that. Mm. See, because we do that kind of stuff. Right. Okay, so because if you look at me like this, I'm talking above your head because yeah. you don't know what I'm talking about. You cannot help me. But if I go like this, as if I was thinking, because I'm talking to you, you're listening, you're thinking about my solution, I can actually just make you mirror me. Wow. And so on. And if I just have a little bit of smile, you're going to smile as well. Wow. And so on. So there are a lot of stuff that we do that some of the people don't know. Wow. And so on. So it's not just about photography. It's about body language. It's about psychology. It's yeah, about, there's a lot of psychology so, in this. Exactly. So that's what we do that to other people who aren't in the HR crew, who aren't students of Peter Hurley, you would not do. You can try to replicate our shots. You're never going to get there because you're not going to get that authentic person yeah. that we usually try to portray our clients to be like. And you need to have people skills to do this. Exactly. Exactly. So there are many ways, you know, I could walk in or you could walk into my studio and... Uh, I come and say, Zion, how are you doing? And then you go, oh, yeah, it's pouring down with rain and stuff. I had a terrible time getting over here. So I had to pick up on that because that's a bad sign already that I'm going to have a hard time with you because you're not in the right mindset as you step foot into the studio. So how I'm going to have to get around to get you there to make you feel comfortable to look the way I want you to, be, to, to look so I can get you that product. So wow. that means I have to work around that to make you forget about what just happened, the traffic, the rain and stuff. You're in the studio, it's dry. There's no traffic. It's you and me. Let's have fun. And I got to get you there within the time that, uh, you know, you're in front of my lens. So cool. And do you have a preference uh, for people coming to your studio or you going to them? Do they get a better result either way? No. I mean, uh, <clears throat> for me, this light right now is a bad light. Yeah? Because... Uh, it's coming from 12 o'clock, basically, yeah. if we say it, because it's right above us, so it's bad. So we're going to have shadows and stuff all over the place. Well, if that's a light that I have to work with to create the shot that I do create in the studio, I'm going to have to modify this light. I'm going to have to find a way to work with this light right here to get the shot that I normally get in the studio. So for me, it doesn't matter where we are. The end result, there's photos on my website that are actually shot at client's place but yet it looked like it was shot in my studio. So you cannot tell the difference between my studio shots and my uh, client's uh, premises shot if I shot those on a white background or gray background. But if I shot on an environmental uh, background, then you would see that, hey, you know, it's uh, shot outdoors in an office somewhere. But if we put a neutral background behind it, you wouldn't be able to tell if it's a studio or if it's uh, on location. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. So cool. Now, what's <clears throat> your biggest business failure? My biggest business failure right now is uh, actually what I was doing in Tasmania because uh, I had a lot of people to help me along the way. And, and uh, the family of the girl that I end up marrying in Tasmania, and I was really young, you know, I was uh, in my early 20s, and I felt like I was, uh, you know, Mr. Noel. And uh, people who were doing businesses 25, 30 years uh, way before me who were trying to help me, I didn't think that, I didn't want to listen to what they had to say. And so, so there were a lot of ways, or a lot of things that I wanted to do for myself, you know, because I felt like I could do it. And uh, withstanding uh, reservation against their advices and stuff like that. And I think that was a little bit of my biggest failure in life, you know, because what I was doing was actually helping a lot of people as well. And uh, we were repairing shipping containers and to the point that we were trying to get into manufacturing shipping containers and so on. Right. And uh, so taking a company with, uh, you know, a handful of people to go into 20, 30, 40 people. So, you know, there were a lot of good stuff that, you know, we were doing, but I could have done a lot better if I was patient. And then you know, taking guidance from people who have been doing things for a long time before yeah. me and so on. And that was actually my biggest failure. And uh, I do regret it, but at the end of the day, you know, we live and learn and uh, I don't think I would be able to replicate that mistake again. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's it. It's how you, it's how you learn from it, isn't Exactly. It? You know, don't, just don't make that mistake twice. No, what, no. On the flip side, what, what's been your biggest success? 
Mm. Uh, that's uh, one of those things that uh, I never could uh, be able to identify for myself. You know, what are my successes or what is my biggest success in life? I've been uh, fortunate, fortunate, you know, to be born in a family where, you know, I was born and stuff like that and uh, being where I've been in life. And uh, some of the things that I've done, which I didn't plan to achieve, but they just happen to be in my life. You know, they're so numerous that I find it difficult to be able to identify one thing that I call my biggest success. And if anything, I would just say that my personal relationship right now with my wife could be my biggest success because, uh, you know, I go to sleep without worrying about anything. I wake up in the morning ready to, you know, face the day. And uh, with her, she's always there backing me up, you know, never question what I'm doing and the direction that I want to take and so forth. And I think that uh, I'm lucky to call that my biggest success in a way. Yeah. yeah because yeah. I made a drastic change in my life giving my life to follow her actually, you know, in Indonesia. And uh, mm. she was always there as well, supporting me with what I wanted to do. If I wanted to travel to the US to go see Peter Hurley, you know, hey babe, jump on a plane and go. Hey, you know what? I need to learn more about lighting and I need to go see this guy in Amsterdam. He's supposed to be the best uh, lighting instructor around the world and so on. Go do it and so on. So all of those little supports and encouragement, I could not get that from, uh, you know, anyone doing what I'm doing. And she's basically my biggest success in a way at yeah. this present time. And I was going to ask you, you know, that leads on to how, how do you learn, like obviously through mentors. So you seek out the best and then you actually try to even visit them. Exactly. And uh, those guys as well, they're very, very reachable, you know, and they're prepared to share what they know. And it's just a matter of reaching out to them. And obviously, you know, they come at a cost as well because they do this for a living. So if you prepare to pay them for their time, they don't hold anything back. You right. know, it's up to you because at the end of the day, they don't feel threatened about you that you're not going to, you know, <clears throat> Peter Hurley charges $5,000 per headshot mm. and so forth. You know, he can give you all my secret who I'm going to be shooting for $5,000. I don't have the name. I don't have the reputation of the track record. So they don't feel that you're a threat. So they yeah. give you anything that you want, especially if you go with specific uh, need and you lay it out to them, they will give you exactly what you need and you can go and wow. do the things that you need. Do you to do. also learn from books, YouTube, podcasts, or is it really, are you more of a one-on-one? -on -one? I'm a, more of a one-on-one. -on -one. Even when it came to my retouching, I actually sought out one of the best retouchers in the world, you know, a Canadian guy named Marco Wolosinovic, and I sent him an email and say, Bruno, that's okay, we can catch up online. You know, so at that time we were using Skype. And uh, so we would get on Skype, spend, you know, we go on block of four hours, which we break in two hours each, just to make sure that I get uh, a great understanding and grasp of what he was telling me. Because uh, when you go on YouTube, people tell you, oh, this is what you do. As opposed to me, I want to know why I'm doing this and yeah. then why I'm using this tool and so forth. And for that reason, I need to find someone who knows the why this tool does what it does and so forth in order for me to do any time I want to. So I always like the one-on-one -on -one a lot better. But yeah. if I was to be in a classroom environment, so be it too. But given the preference, one-on-one. -on -one. What, what do you think are the biggest keys to success as an entrepreneur? Uh, biggest key to success at this present time and I got to find out early in my life that it's networking. Mm -hmm. It's not about who, I mean, how great you are. It's all about who you know. And in Tasmania, I had a you know, small engineering company. How did, I get, how did I get the company going? Because the later to be my father-in-law was in engineering. And we happened to get mixed up with the uh, Minister of Immigration, you know, in Tasmania at the time, Senator Michael Tate, you know. And uh, my father-in-law is a good buddy with the guy who is in transport and so forth. So all of those things, you know, was able to allow me to get into that business that I didn't know anything about and so forth. So 
if it wasn't because of the network that my you know, ex father in law had and uh, Senator Tate and, uh, you know, the people at Smart Distribution that I work with and so on, I wouldn't be able to do what I did or it would have taken me maybe 10 years before I could, you know, achieve uh, what I achieved at the time. So when it comes to being a good business person or to grow your business, network is all about and so on. And uh, right now I'm here with you because of networking. Yeah. So if it wasn't because of that, I wouldn't have come across you. And I know that maybe sometime down the track we might do business or we might refer each other business and stuff like that, but that's how it is. And <clears throat> you're right. Like, I mean, one of the things that I saw in you yeah. was you're really good at networking. And the fact that I've <clears throat> talked to other people about, and your name has come up, is, is proof of that. Mm. What are some strategies that, that people can learn? Uh, when you meet people, it doesn't matter where, it's always uh, worthwhile to follow up that meetup. If you exchange business card with someone or you just have a chat, let's catch up, make sure you do it. And uh, because when it comes to networking, unlike networking to grow your business or to get out there, it's not like speed dating, you know, so I'm using that analogy. If uh, we go out and then we meet so many people at once, we might get lucky that someone in that room might give us business that day and so forth. But the majority of those people in the place, they're not going to give us business. So I try to equate that to a speed dating. You might get lucky on the first night, like we said, because that one person was at the right place, who was at the right place at that time and they gave you business, but otherwise you're gonna have to work and, and uh, build up a relationship with people and so on. And uh, hmm. I learned that if you are the first giver, you're always gonna benefit much more than the person that you give to yeah. in the first place. And uh, yeah. that's been the biggest uh, strategy that I've been using. And uh, it's something that I've been taught long time ago and not so much as a network uh, uh, you know, tip, but just as being a human being, you yeah. know, be the first giver. And I didn't bring anything for you today because it was pouring down with rain. <laughs> so otherwise I would walk in here with a cup of coffee <laughs> at least. Mate, your, your story has already <laughs> given a lot. The MBA, was, that's good enough for me. <laughs> yeah. Following up, which a lot of people don't do. They might meet people, but they don't bother to follow up. No, no. That's too hard. And, and you followed me up, which is fantastic. Mm. Um, and then giving. Be the first to give rather than being so calculative and, exactly. oh, no, let me wait first. I yeah. totally agree with that. Yeah. So, great tips. Now, Bruno, uh, what are your future plans over the next year? Are you going to continue to grow this, this business? Uh, I haven't shared this one publicly, so I'm going to share it with you. Yeah. I know my wife knows about it. <laughs> Basically... Um, I got my mentor, Peter Hurley, in the US. He's known as the best headshot photographer in the world. And my aim is to be known as the best headshot photographer in Australia. And uh, I know it's just uh, being able to get into the right circle and uh, working with the right people to be able to get that recognition. Wow. You know, because uh, as long as I'm still working with my local people and so forth, it's fine. But if I could find a way to elevate the kind of work that I'm doing with the type of client that I'm, you know, I would like to have and so forth, and uh, it would be great. So basically this is my goal wow. for the next year and beyond. To be, the, to be recognized as the best Australian headshot, headshot photographer. photographer. Fantastic. Yeah. And look, Bruno, is there anything else you'd like to share that you're passionate about at all? Uh, when it comes to passion for our day-to-day -day living, it's uh, what we do, you know, to be able to pay the bill. But my passion in life has been uh, just to be 
happy and then make sure that the people around me are happy as well. So you will never, never, never know if I have a problem or not because uh, uh, people always tend to see me as a big goofball. And I like that approach, and which is uh, for me being the eldest, another one for you as well, the eldest of 11 boys <laughs> in my family. <laughs> and boys as well. Yes. And so, wow. and uh, I had to keep everybody happy or, you yeah. know, and I grew up with that mentality as well in me. So for that reason, you know, I walk around, you know, making sure that anyone attached or anyone who touched me that day, you know, gonna feel good about themselves in one way or another. And that's just me wanting to be a good human being. And uh, I made it my thing every day to be a good human being. And uh, so it's been like a passion for me, basically. Beautiful. Look, Bruno, thanks so much. That was awesome. What a jam-packed podcast. Yeah. We could go on for another hour. Um, but I'll leave it at that and say thank you for coming on the show. Thanks for having me, man. We will put your, your business is called Lightbent. Lightbent Images and Photography. Lightbent Images and Photography. We'll put yeah. the, um, the website in the show notes. Look, use Bruno. I'll be using Bruno. Use Bruno if you can for your headshots. He's fantastic. And just one thing for oh. those people listening to this podcast, if they're coming, booking the headshot. Yes. You know from you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They can just uh, use the coupon code. Oh, great. Alika. Alika. So coupon 200. code A-L-Y-K-A. Alika. 200. Alika 200. Yes. A-L-Y-K-A 200. That is the coupon code. I'll put it in the show notes. Thank you so much. All right. Me. And they can use that only on my deluxe. Oh service on the deluxe so you can use that on the deluxe service and you'll get a discount so thank you so much bruno thanks a lot have a great day